The hospital room was bustling with activity, the beeps and whirls of machines creating a symphony of medical urgency. I lay there, my mind a swirl of pain and anticipation. My husband, John, held my hand tightly, offering words of encouragement that barely penetrated the fog of my labor pains. Sarah, you're doing great. Just breathe, John said, his voice a steady anchor in the storm. In the corner of the room, Martha, my mother-in-law, sat quietly, her face a mask of concern. But behind those furrowed brows and pursed lips, something sinister lurked. Can I get you anything, Martha? John asked, his attention momentarily shifting. No, dear, I'm fine. Just worried about Sarah, she replied, her voice dripping with a concern that didn't quite reach her eyes. The contractions were coming faster now, each wave stronger than the last. I gritted my teeth, trying to focus on the thought of finally holding my baby. Almost there, Sarah, I can see the head, the doctor announced, snapping me back to the moment. That's when I noticed Martha moving towards the medical supplies, her movements stealthy, almost cat-like. She reached for something, her back turned to us. Martha, what are you doing over there? I gasped, my attention suddenly diverted from my pain. Oh, just looking for some water, dear, she replied, but her tone was too casual, her hands fidgeting with something I couldn't see. Just then, Nurse Helen, a vigilant and sharp-eyed woman who had been monitoring my progress, stepped in. She moved towards Martha, her eyes narrowing. Ma'am, I need you to step back. This area is for staff only, Nurse Helen said firmly. But I was just... Martha started. No buts. Please, sit down. Sarah needs a calm environment. Nurse Helen insisted, guiding Martha back to her seat. The room's tension seemed to pause for a moment, everyone's attention momentarily diverted. I saw Nurse Helen glance at the spot where Martha had been standing, her expression a mix of suspicion and concern. After a few more grueling minutes, the sound of a baby's cry filled the room. Relief washed over me as I collapsed back onto the pillows, exhausted but elated. Congratulations, Sarah and John. You have a beautiful baby boy, the doctor announced. As John cut the cord and the nurses cleaned our son, I couldn't help but notice Nurse Helen keeping a discreet but watchful eye on Martha. Later, when the excitement had settled down and I was left alone with John and our son, I broached the subject. John, did you notice anything odd about your mom earlier? I asked, my voice still weak from the exertion. Odd? No, why? She's just concerned about you, Sarah. You know how she is, John replied, his brow furrowing in confusion. I don't know. Maybe I'm just tired, but something felt off, I said, the image of Martha near the medical supplies replaying in my mind. Sarah, you've been through a lot today. Let's just focus on our little miracle here, John said, gently placing our son in my arms. As I looked down at my baby, a feeling of unease nestled in my heart. I knew Martha's concern was a facade, but with no proof and only my instincts to go on, I resolved to stay vigilant. The incident was dismissed as a mere misunderstanding, yet I couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more, something darker, lurking beneath Martha's maternal guise. Sitting in the dimly lit living room, the shadows seemed to dance across the walls, mirroring the turmoil in my mind. The incident at the hospital with Martha, my mother-in-law, wasn't the first red flag. There were others, like the time she accidentally gave me expired food and the baby expired milk. I couldn't shake off the feeling that there was something more sinister at play. I picked up the phone and dialed a number I never thought I'd need. Hello, Dan. I need your help. Dan, a private investigator known for his discretion, listened intently as I recounted my experiences. So, you suspect your mother-in-law has been intentionally trying to harm you? Dan asked, his voice a mix of concern and professionalism. Yes, and I need to know if I'm just being paranoid, or if there's really something going on. Over the next few weeks, Dan dug into Martha's past. We met regularly, discussing his findings over cups of coffee in quiet cafes. I've spoken to a few people who knew Martha. There's a pattern of manipulative behavior, but we need more concrete evidence, Dan said, his brow furrowed in concentration. Determined to uncover the truth, I decided to speak to some of Martha's old acquaintances myself. The first was Linda, a former neighbor. As I sat across from her in her cozy kitchen, the aroma of freshly baked cookies filled the air. Martha was always a bit off. I remember her doing things, petty things to get back at people she didn't like, Linda revealed, 
her hands nervously playing with her teacup. Can you give me an example? I probed, my heart racing. There was this one time she spread a nasty rumor about another neighbor just because they had a disagreement. It nearly ruined the poor woman's reputation, Linda said, a hint of fear in her eyes. My next visit was to Betty, who used to work with Martha. Martha was always sweet as pie to your face, but behind your back, she was a different person. Betty confided as we sat on a park bench, watching the autumn leaves fall. She ever do anything harmful? I asked, dreading the answer. Martha once sabotaged a co-worker's project out of spite. Got the woman fired, Betty said, shaking her head. Each story added another piece to the puzzle, painting a picture of a woman capable of great cruelty. One evening, as John and I sat down for dinner, I decided to broach the subject. John, we need to talk about your mother. What about her? John asked, looking up from his plate. I've been talking to people. There's a pattern of toxic behavior, and I'm worried about our safety, I said, my voice trembling slightly. Sarah, are you sure you're not overreacting? Mom can be difficult, but she's not a monster, John replied, his tone skeptical. I wish I were overreacting, but the things I've heard, they're serious, John. John sighed, his expression torn. I just can't believe Mom would intentionally harm us. The conversation ended with tension in the air. I lay awake that night, struggling with a mix of disbelief, anger, and a sense of betrayal. The woman who was supposed to be family seemed like a stranger, and the home I had felt safe in now felt like a battleground. As the days passed, the evidence mounted. Dan brought me more stories, more instances of Martha's cruelty. Yet, with each revelation, my heart grew heavier. How could I protect my family from someone who was supposed to be part of it? The chapter closed with me grappling with the weight of my discoveries, knowing that the next steps would alter the course of our lives forever. The truth was unraveling, and with it, any semblance of normalcy I had clung to. The air in the living room was thick with the aroma of a holiday feast, a sharp contrast to the tension that gripped my heart. Family members chatted idly, unaware of the storm that was about to break. I glanced at John, seeking a silent reassurance. He gave a slight nod his face a mixture of support and apprehension. As Martha entered the room, her presence seemed to fill the space with an invisible, suffocating cloud. She smiled and greeted everyone, playing the perfect hostess. I cleared my throat, my voice barely above a whisper but enough to draw the attention of the room. I need to say something. The room fell silent, all eyes on me. For a while now, I've been noticing things, concerning things about Martha. My voice grew steadier with each word. Martha's smile faltered, her eyes narrowing. What are you talking about, Sarah? I've gathered evidence, I continued. Evidence that shows a pattern of harmful, manipulative behavior from Martha. Murmurs rippled through the room. John's aunt whispered to her husband, disbelief etched on her face. This is absurd, Sarah. What evidence could you possibly have? Martha's voice was laced with feigned incredulity. Expired food given to me and my baby a near-miss incident at the hospital, and stories from people who have known Martha. I held my ground, my resolve firm. You're accusing me of trying to harm you? That's ridiculous. Martha's voice rose, a tinge of panic beneath her words. The room erupted into chaos, family members talking over each other, some in shock, others in denial. Everyone, please! John's voice cut through the noise. Let's hear her out. I explained everything. The hospital incident, the private investigator, the testimonies from Linda and Betty. With each revelation, the expressions around the room shifted, from disbelief to horror to confusion. This is a family, not a courtroom, Martha shot back, her facade slipping. You're tearing us apart with these baseless accusations. Baseless? The evidence speaks for itself, I retorted, my patience wearing thin. John stepped forward, placing a hand on my shoulder. I've seen the evidence. It's hard to ignore. You believe her over your own mother? Martha's voice cracked, a mixture of anger and desperation. I... I don't know what to believe. But we can't ignore what Sarah has brought to light, John said, his voice heavy with conflict. The family was split, some siding with Martha out of disbelief or loyalty, others uncertain. The room became a battlefield of words and emotions. I've always welcomed you into this family, Sarah. How could you do this? Martha's eyes were wet with tears, but her words felt hollow. 
I did this to protect my family, to protect us from lies and manipulation, I said, my voice unwavering. As the evening wore on, the arguments faded into exhausted murmurs. The family gathering had turned into a scene of division and disbelief. John and I sat quietly in the aftermath, the weight of what had transpired settling around us like a heavy blanket. Sarah, I'm sorry. I never wanted it to come to this, John murmured, his eyes filled with sorrow. We did what we had to do, John. For our son, for our family, I replied, my heart aching for the rift that had been created. That night, as I lay in bed, the events of the day replayed in my mind. I had confronted the truth, but at what cost? My heart was heavy, not just with the burden of what I had revealed, but with the uncertainty of what lay ahead for us as a family torn apart by secrets and lies. The morning light streamed through the windows of our new home, a symbol of the fresh start John and I had dared to embark upon. Our little boy played on the floor, his laughter a balm to the wounds of the past months. As I sipped my coffee, I reflected on the journey that brought us here. Mommy, look. Our son held up a drawing, a crude depiction of our family. It was simple, yet it represented everything we had fought to protect. That's beautiful, sweetie. Let's put it on the fridge, I said, my heart swelling with love. John walked in, a smile on his face as he watched our son. How are you feeling today? Hopeful, I replied. I think we made the right decision moving here. I know we did. It's a new beginning for us, away from all the negativity, John agreed, wrapping an arm around me. The move was more than a change of scenery. It was a step towards healing. I had started volunteering at a local support group, sharing my story and helping others who faced similar struggles with toxic family members. Later that week, at one of the meetings, I spoke to a group of women, each battling their own demons. Finding the courage to stand up against a toxic family member is never easy. But remember, you're not alone, I told them, my voice steady and strong. One woman, Emily, approached me afterward. Your story, it's so similar to mine. How did you find the strength? It wasn't easy. It took everything I had. But when I looked at my son, I knew I had to fight for a better future for us. I explained, hoping my words offered some comfort. Back at home, John and I often talked about Martha and the fallout from the confrontation. News had reached us that she faced social ostracism as more truths about her behavior came to light. Do you think she'll ever change? John asked one evening, a hint of sadness in his voice. I don't know, John, but we can't let the hope of what she could be overshadow us. We need to focus on our family and moving forward, I replied. Our decision to not reconcile with Martha stood firm. It was a boundary set for the safety and well-being of our family. Months passed, and our new life began to take root. We made friends, our son thrived in his new environment, and I found fulfillment in my advocacy work. One day, as I played with our son in the backyard, John came out with two cups of tea. Here's to new beginnings, he said, handing me a cup. To new beginnings and to finding peace, I replied clinking my cup against his. As I watched our son chase butterflies, I realized that this was what victory looked like. It wasn't loud or dramatic. It was in the quiet moments of joy and the strength found in overcoming adversity. Our story didn't end with grand gestures or dramatic confrontations. It ended with us, a family, building a life filled with love, respect, and boundaries. We had faced our trials, and in doing so, we had emerged stronger, more united, as the sun set, painting the sky in hues of orange and pink, I felt a deep sense of peace. We had weathered the storm, and now, we were basking in the calm that followed. Our journey had brought us here, to a place of healing and hope. And in that moment, I knew that no matter what the future held, we were ready to face it together. The story of Sarah's struggle and triumph over her toxic mother-in-law has come to an end. How would you have handled the situation if you were in Sarah's shoes? Would you have made the same decisions or taken a different path? Share your thoughts and experiences in the comments below. If you enjoyed this story and want to see more, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel for more compelling content. Your support and interaction mean the world to us. Here, 